I'd like to point out this man's lovely t-shirt. We just got some new swag in. <laughs> Official Carex Apparel and our model right here. They're available $500 a piece. <laughs> they don't include him, so. I actually do. <laughs> um, well, we're, before we kick off and say thanks to our sponsors, just real quick, uh, community updates. Do you want to talk about the next Culture community, yes. yes. Culture community, we are having an event next Thursday. It's really exciting. Rachel O'Meara is a Google exec, and she is also um, author of a new book called Pause, Harnessing the Life-Changing Power of Giving Yourself a Break. She's coming in from San Francisco. She's doing a talk at the Dream Bank. She's doing a talk at Culture Community. It's going to be incredible. We're co-hosting it with the Madison Women in Tech and the Madison Google Developer Group, so it's going to be really awesome. So uh, for more information and to RSVP, go to culture.community. And yeah, and then that night, Park Hotel is actually also hosting a happy hour for Rachel as well. So, Woo! two awesome events that day. What's Fantastic name? name. My last name? No. Oh, oh. hers. <laughs> I was like, who be? Um, Omira. Rachel oh. Omira. And what's your phone number again? <laughs> <laughs> After the show. <laughs> and then we have Forward Fest fast approaching. So, um, there are going to be a ton of events. I believe that you can do early bird registration right now. So, if you go to Forward Fest website, uh, forwardfest.org, and you can go purchase your pass and ha get access to a bunch of different events and start to see kind of what the lineup is looking like. We'll be participating in Ben Fair via One Million Cups, which is a great chance to see who are some of the players in the startup ecosystem. So we encourage you to come out and support One Million Cups and Ben Fair. Any other announcements that I'm missing? Not really. DP, how'd it go yesterday? It went really well. It was amazing. It was I, I gave a talk at Dream Bank on nonfiction branding and um, had a great turnout thanks to none of the people in this group. Oh. <laughs> and I'm saying Julianne is the only one who gets a pass because she brought me donuts saying I'm sorry. <laughs> I was there. Well, yeah, well, Leah. Leah represented. Way to go, Leah. <laughs> awesome. So again, a special thanks to our sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't have this great event. We have coffee from Old National Bank over here. It's delicious. So help yourself. We've been getting a little bit more so we don't run out. Derek, faithful supporter since day one. Field 59 providing live video stream and um, video recording. So you can find those video recordings on our YouTube channel and you can always um, join the live stream um, via the link on our website or in our newsletter. If you haven't signed up for a newsletter, I suggest you do. It only comes out once a week, and it'll give you an idea of who's presenting um, and some of the different things that are happening in the community. And then we've got this library who's donated this awesome space. So um, I guess without further ado, I'm Rachel Neal, CEO of Carex Consulting Group. I'm Drew Corson from Carex. I'm Leah Rowe with uh, Health Finch and Culture Community. I almost said Carex. <laughs> oh, my name, is, my name is Eric Brown. I'm a business consultant. I work with companies on planning, marketing, and financing. I'm also a member of Merle and Mentors. Oh, wow, sorry. <laughs> I'm Brian Davis, Old National Bank. Andrew Gonzalez, Old National Bank. My name is Diana Pastrana. I work with uh, companies that are remodeling their offices. Uh, Julianne Selesky from the Madison Club. Neil Mathwig, I'm a real estate agent with Realty Executives. Uh, Aiden Winery, M3 Insurance. Travis Human, I own Stray Cat Bicycles, which is an internet connect, um, consumer direct uh, internet based bike company. Alex Ryan, founder of uh, Prairie Light Solar, it's a renewable energy consulting firm. I'm DP Knuton. I work with uh, my company Collaborator Creative, collaborating creatively with uh, individuals and businesses on everything from custom writing to nonfiction branding TM. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Dennis Barnum. Uh, today I'm here with Merlin Mentors, and actually uh, they talked about the Venn Fair. After that event, there, we have a thing that's sponsored by Merlin Mentors, which I'm part of. Um, called a pitch and replay. It's a chance for you to pitch your business or your idea up to five times to different audiences and get immediate feedback. And if you are one of the people doing the pitch, your, your event uh, will be comped. You'll get in for free. So uh, if you want to get some opportunity to pitch your idea and see what, what the others think of it, look at badgerstartup.com. Check it out. Uh, my name is Trezzy. I'm a software consultant. I'm also working on a podcast right now uh, for the 100 State Coworking Space, sponsored by Madison Magazine, trying to capture the entrepreneurial spirit through conversation. So, just, just saying. <laughs> I'm Clara Benzo, HR manager at Akita Box. 
Um, Laurel Gosheray, customer success at Box. I'm Mitch DeWitt, I'm with Merrill Lynch Wealth Management and I help my clients align their investments with their values by incorporating environmental and social criteria into their portfolio. Amanda Schweigler, uh, product manager, currently taking a break after an exhausting contract just wrapped up. Susie <laughs> <laughs> Bianco, Merlin Mentors Program Director. Hi, I'm Steve Sladen. I'm a business and technical professional here networking. Angie Allen, and I'm a marketing and operations professional with Number One Networks. <laughs> Tracy Dalton with Arcanum Advisors. Howdy all, I'm Christopher Patterson with Medisoft Solutions. We provide CTO style guidance and software development for pre-series A tech startups. I'm Derek Gebler with uh, Field 59. We're an online video platform for social media and media companies. And I'm here today yeah. with my daughter, Grace. <laughs> I'm here by accident. Our power went out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Laura Lawrence from Nine Bark Creative Consulting. Scott Cole with um, Third Space. Uh, Dan Anderson with Baker Tilly. Brom Dolmans, Wisconsin Technology Council. Uh, my name is Jason Ockrainer, and I'm here today as a person who is going through the process of starting their own company. Okay. Well, with that, we'll turn it over to Randy. <laughs> good morning. Do I need the mic or am I right? You're good. All right. Uh, I'm Randy Nagin with Fast Forward Forensics. Uh, we're into biological sample collection devices, started you know, back in 2012. And what we've been finding is that a lot of our products have applications into other markets. So if you want to go into other markets with fast forward forensics, it can be a little limiting. So we're going to be adopting a new name called Genturi. And if you're familiar with your Latin, uh, Turi means protect. So Genturi makes a lot of sense when you're looking at protecting biological evidence from a point of collection and getting into a laboratory, which is what our main applications are. So if you're familiar with some of the devices out there today, we're going to be faster, better, and cheaper. So let's talk a little bit about the company. Um, I uh, started the company, as I say, in, in May. Um, since that time, I've been focused on getting this company going on my own. Prior to that, though, I've had 26 years in uh, the DNA uh, forensic sector with companies like Life Technologies, Promega, uh, Bodhi Technology, Wattman, um, GE. Um, and uh, what I've done is, in all of those, the theme through most of them has been on the front end sample collection has been a, a theme throughout my career. Because of that, when the National Institute of Standards and Technology was looking at putting together a technical working group on uh, preservation of biological evidence, I was the only private sector person asked to be part of that team, given the fact most of the evidence collection devices uh, had a hand in uh, putting to market. So uh, during that time, I came up with an idea as I was looking at how people were mismanaging evidence in various police lockers and uh, locations to uh, collect them, cruisers of police cars, et cetera, and getting them to a uh, laboratory. I said, well, there's got to be a better way. And as you're looking at a blood tube, it goes from the point of collection into uh, a laboratory onto a machine and ready to go. So well, why can't we do the same thing? And well, you've got a few parameters like, you know, it's got to be room temperature, it's got to go you know, through deserts and who knows what not, et cetera. So can we take care of those kinds of problems? So that's what the challenge uh, I took on based on what I was seeing when I was at NIST. Uh, I figured, well, this will have play in the medical community, so I've asked uh, Chris Schroffnagel, who's currently uh, with the GE Healthcare Group, to uh, uh, come on board with me. Well, she's going to be responsible for taking on the products that we produce and getting them ready to go uh, through our ISO and into FDA approval processes. And then uh, an engineer by the name of Todd Bakken, who uh, has been, uh, again, around the university and uh, AI and the places where he's been a uh, product manager and production and has got 13 patents. So problem solving, getting things going is, is his name of his game. So the three of us, we're now looking to take the company into a place where we're getting ready to commercialize product. So when I started the product, I said, well, okay, it's going to take a while to get things going and I wanted to bootstrap it. So the way to do it was to uh, resell other people's products. So we came up with strategic <laughs> partners like a company called Fitsco that did uh, a lot of collection devices. Uh, since then, I've actually added a few more we'll talk about quickly, but bottom line got a good set of suppliers that were focused on the front end collection of biological sample collection and the way we were making money was to resell their products as we were preparing products to go to market ourselves. 
Uh, as we were starting to get our product to go to market, um, we needed a, an injection molding uh, company, so um, non-metallic components up in Poinette is the company we use for doing that. So what's the problem we're addressing? Genetic testing is really taking off. Anybody heard of Ancestry.com, Exact Sciences, a few of these kinds of companies? The problem they have is they no longer are working in a network like LockCorp has or a clinical labs. They're having product collected at a home or somebody is going to collect basically a biological sample has to be able to be collected by anyone anywhere. That's the problem and really hasn't been solved correctly. And we'll talk a little bit about what the options are today and what needs to be improved on that. But if you take a look at uh, on this slide, what you start off with is that anybody has done Ancestry.com? Ancestry spit in the device. How long did it take? It was about four, four to six weeks to get the results back. <laughs> so you use a kit, something like this. Um, this is the wonderful little the small device that they use where you get to fill up this little black line with saliva. No bubbles, by the way. So as you're going away here, I'm guessing what, 20 minutes, 25 oh, yeah. minutes? Fill yeah, so by the, time, by the time you get that done, then you get to close it and there's a liquid up here that runs down and once that's all done, you get to take it off and replace it with a cap and put it into a non-biohazard bag off to the laboratory. So, you think there's room for improvement? A little, few many manipulations. You know, I think the latest ad I just saw was, you know, Southern girls don't like to spit, but we had to do it anyway, kind of thing, something along that line. So, um, there's better, easier ways to collect biological samples. There's also the low cost option. Trouble with that is you don't have to retake samples. And as you're doing things like chain of custody, a lot of samples are retaken not only because of a poor sample, which could be due to a poor collection, could be due to poor preservation, but it could be that the information wasn't uh, collected correctly with it. So information with the data with the sample is critical as keeping that as part of the overall process. So the bottom line is all your solutions today are very cumbersome and we've got to find a better way uh, to do things a little more streamlined. So what we come up with is a product called the Swab Saver. So the Swab Saver, we have a number of ways to uh, present this product. I'll just take the product by itself, but the, uh, the logic here is we wanted to take a sample uh, that would go from the point of collection right into processing in the laboratory. So you start backwards, what works in the laboratory and let's see if we can get it to work at the point of collection and preserve the product all the way through. And that's where the swab saver comes in. I'll pass this around the room so you can take a closer look. When you look at it, what the uh, intellectual property is part of the patent we have on this is a few things. One is uh, you'll see in the mouth of it, it's not open, there's a little tiny thing in here called the swab breaker. And when you look at the size of that, it basically allows you to put any swab into it and break the head off. So you don't need any special swab. The beauty of this, and the forensics folks love this, if I'm doing a touched piece of DNA or something really big, it doesn't matter. All can go into the swab saver very simply. And once that's done, you pull the, the uh, device uh, out that broke it, and you'll see their cap has a uh, chamber in it which has a silica gel desiccant. Forensic sciences preserve samples by desiccating them. That preserves very well. If you put a biological blood saliva onto a solid support and dry it effectively, it will preserve for years. PKU testing. Anybody had their heel stick done with their baby? I think every one of us. And they put that little heel stick and uh, draw that filter paper on the bottom. Those filter papers are still sitting in filing cabinets in the hospitals. I can go back to that, take a punch from that filter paper and get a full genetic profile from them as an example of the technology behind how this works. So once you've got your sample in, you're now going to pull a foil off the top of this desiccant to activate the desiccant, pop it shut into a tube. Uh, 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 you know, pouch for back to the laboratory. So that's the swab saver process. You can pass that around so we can look at it. So with that, then we say, well, how do we put this into a kit format that makes it very, very simple? So uh, we come up with the Genturi kit that we can compete with uh, the device I just showed you that Ancestry.com currently uses. And what you have in here is two swabs and a tab that has the um, swab saver in it. You just pull the tab off, take the uh, swab saver out, put it into the hole that's sitting there so it's sitting and being held for you. You would take one of the swabs, swab your cheek for about 20 seconds. And the way that these uh, swabs are designed to work, I'll put this down and actually do it for you very quickly. The beauty of this is that these swabs uh, are large enough compared to a standard uh, swab. I can get five to eight micrograms of DNA off each one of these using either a uh, Promega or Kyogen type of extraction. You would just like, you would use a toothbrush, but on the inside of your cheek, 
and then it ejects actually just like this into the tube. Uh, so you now have a sample inside the tube, pop it closed, away you go. A lot easier than sitting there for 20 minutes spinning into a device. So this is what we're looking at is giving you a nice high value auction that is a very simple, very few uh, manipulations. Uh, a swab, eject, close, away you go. Uh, a lot easier. So given the markets, I said we changed our name, uh, changing it from fast forward to Genturi. Our current markets have been the forensics where we started off with, so we're working closely with the military who's already uh, tested in their laboratories, love it. Now we're looking to uh, have they go through their theater for collection. The beauty of this, you can have those swabs in one hand and the swab savers in the other, see something you want to swab, collect them together and off to the laboratory. Our data so far you'll see uh, is got one year stability at room temperature. Uh, and when we put that to the laboratory and do a genetic profile, you get a full uh, non-degraded type profile that looks excellent for uh, doing the analysis on. Uh, my expectation is um, that'll last about four or five years, but so far you have one year uh, of real-time studies. But as you take a look at the markets, that we're looking to go into, whether it's ancestry, and of course, eventually, disease screening, and I'm sure everybody's aware how uh, the FDA has recently approved uh, 10 FDA-approved type uh, uh, screens, and that market is about to explode. And that's where we're gonna be focused, is uh, getting our collection devices that will compete with the market leader, which we just saw with the SPIT device, that's the, the market leader right now, with a very simple collection device, that as these labs start doing it, same thing's gonna happen in the medical market as happened in the forensic market, is they'll have more samples than they can process, things will sit around longer than they thought they could, and all of a sudden, you know, well, do you really need a year preservation at room temperature? The answer is you will. Uh, that's really how I see the market going. But as these markets grow, uh, there's gonna be additional, they, there's wellness markets. I don't know if they may have seen a DNA fit where you're taking a look at your, based on your genetic profile, they'll tell you what supplements to take. Uh, there's all kinds of lifestyle uh, uh, companies come into play. So all these kinds of companies have great ideas for the back end that really haven't thought through how they're gonna get their samples collected and into the laboratory. So the biggest competitor is the DNA Genetech, this device we just uh, demonstrated earlier today. So you can see they're in the $30 million market range and growing. Uh, these other competitors are blood tube. 65 years, guys, we've been using blood tubes. It's the gold standard. But of course, it has to be refrigerated. You need a phlebotomist to do it. It costs a lot of money. So 30% of the tests that are done with blood today could in fact be done this way because they're more genetic-based type testing versus serology-based. Um, Maui is one that has a tube, but you, when you swab it with a rather cotton tip swab, you have to squeegee it like a mop four times to do it. So even more manipulation than the one we just saw. The others are actually smaller devices, so when you take a look at the amount of DNA you need, I mentioned about you know five to eight micrograms of DNA. You know, for most genetic tests, that's all you need. But when I have been doing my market research, a lot of laboratories want 20 micrograms. Well, why do you need 20? Well, that's what we're used to. I say, you really don't need 20 micrograms anymore. But most of these devices only be down into uh, a few micrograms range, which would not suffice for a lot of the applications we're talking about today. So we take a look at the projected sales. Our current company is this dark blue line. That's what our current sales are. As we get the swab saver into market, all this is the swab saver market that we're looking at. So the real growth is going to be, you know, going into that direct consumer market, starting off with, you know, um, working our way from law enforcement. Um, we're currently working with companies like Promega and Kaigen to integrate the uh, processing of the sample into their workflows. Uh, Ancestry, Aurora, a lot of the community health organizations, again, they are unlike a lot of where they don't have a great community of uh, <laughs> clinics to collect their samples. They need better ways, uh, simpler ways to do it, uh, and eventually uh, into the larger companies that are doing uh, FDA approved collection kits. Excuse me, what does the yes. stand for? So oh, a direct to consumer? Oh, okay, yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. direct to consumer. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So if you take a look at the existing business, where we are in our expanding SCR business, we are an existing company with, uh, so far this year, $280,000 in sales, projected to be over 500,000 in sales. One man company at the moment doing that, as well as getting everything going here. Uh, we've picked up additional suppliers, like I mentioned, Fitsco, uh, Microdata Electronics does a punching device to take samples from uh, solid support materials. Um, Qualitype is a, 
uh, software company. So we're in the software instrumentation as well as consumer business, all focused on the front end, all of which have applications into the medical markets as we move into those markets as well. Already setting up our international distributors. We have uh, business already in India, but we have distributors already set up in Thailand and over in uh, Brazil. And then we've already have contracts. So we pr currently provide all the sexual assault kits for the state of Wisconsin and in New Hampshire. Just got a contract uh, late last week from Ohio as well for doing the collection uh, for the kits that um, go to the FBI database. Uh, mm -hmm. As you get uh, convicted with the charge, your samples collected. But on the expanding side, we've already patented the swab saver, got it to market to uh, uh, laboratories for testing, proved that it does what we said it was going to do. So we've got data to show we'll preserve samples for one year at room temperature and um, made our first sale to get things going. But as we got all that behind us, now we're ready to get into scale production. And this is where we're looking for our first round of financing to get started here. So you've got our clean room, dispensers, things going, as well as the uh, facility R&D to start testing our products for uh, other applications. So to put it into a very simple form, we've got a lot of our existing businesses going. Uh, moving the new product, we'll do what we said it's going to do. And now as we are shooting for our ISO 13, 485 for a medical device, where our predicate is already set using the DNA genotype product. Uh, we're looking to uh, take about seven to eight months to get that um, taken care of, along with some additional R&D for uh, new uh, product applications. So we're asking for $1.5 million to get that done. Uh, the money will be spent, as you see here. Uh, in addition to that, we're registered with the Wisconsin Economic Development Group uh, for $200,000 tax credit and, and eligible potentially for uh, a loan along that line. So if you take a look at exits, you know, uh, DNA, uh, the Genotech was bought by Orisher Technologies. Uh, their sales at the time were about $14 million. They were bought for $53 million, so you're seeing about a 3.7x there. Uh, the same kind of ratio was uh, done when ASI was bought by Thermo Fisher. So uh, if you're looking at about a $20, $28 million in sales as we're projected to do in the next five years, you can look at 3.7x as a, a comparable exit strategy there. So that's really what I wanted to tell you about today. Any questions? Yes? You're building a better mousetrap, a product, correct? That is correct. Is that, is your brand ever going to surface directly to consumer in terms of, I prefer Genturi to competitor, or is it strictly going to be within a Ancestry.com Department of Defense wrapper? Yes. So I'm looking at a number of things. I also work with uh, laboratories. So in order to do the first step where if you want to go to a, a Walgreens and see a kit on the shelf, not only do you need the collection device, but you need the service to go behind it, we're working on doing that as well as an OEM to uh, provide Ancestry with a kit. Okay, but at this phase, you're mostly about the product, not the product and service combination? That's correct. Yes? So when, we, when you first posed the question, we talked about how Ancestry takes like four to six weeks to get results back. So your product, which is making that more efficient, but doesn't make the timeline any shorter. Well, it's, it's the workflow is shorter. So for, the, for example, to start, start it off, um, shipping that device is, is costly and you're gonna get a big tube of solution. The first thing they do is take an overnight precipitation to get the DNA down. By the time that is done, I could already get a profile, as an example. Right, so, but are you working with the companies to make make that more accurate. Yes, the second half, the first focus is the products, right. also working with the laboratories to make that happen. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Could you run back to your uh, fundraising side? Um, so sales and marketing, that, that seems like a pretty significant number. Um, what's your sales strategy? To so um, when you take a look at the, the split between the markets, um, there are customers that are already doing um, blood draws that could be, in fact, uh, doing a non-invasive collection. They need a little bit more convincing, and there's about 600 of laboratories in that kind of uh, neck of the woods. So there will be some partnering going on, but there will be a lot of uh, direct sales involved with that because as you look at ASHG and some of these other AACs, they'll be having to do a lot of support along those lines. There's also going to be companies already switched to a non-invasive collection, but we've got a better mousetrap to uh, pick them up uh, and take that market share. The hardest one is when you look at precision, <coughs> system, 
the market is just in its infancy. So as we look at companies getting their FDA approval, they now all of a sudden become a target as they're looking to commercialize what they have, and that's what's gonna take a lot of effort as well. So a lot, a lot of that money is also gonna be in the marketing side as well as the direct sales. Yes, sir. Um, you said that you are both looking at um, contracting with you know some of the existing agency or existing companies that are doing the gen genetic testing, as well as possibly doing your own, um, as well. Which actually, like, if you were going to do your do it yourself, wouldn't you want to keep this product as a sales, um, like as a as a as a reason for consumers to choose your product over, say, 23andMe? Or would it be, like, if you contract out with 23andMe, what are you gonna use as a reason to, for people to use your service instead of that? So the answer to your question is, if there are so many applications for what we're talking about. So if I was working with 23andMe, Ancestry, Exact, whoever the case may be, that's gonna be the primary focus for the business, okay? Doing what we do on ourselves will be more on a consumer level, uh, things where we probably won't find large customers for, whether it's a, a wellness kit, for example. So take this sample, I'm working with a small genetics company that has found markers that says, based on your genetic profile, these are the best supplements for you to take. So the answer to your question is segmentation. Yes, sir. Um, so the, so I, I think the formula for a better mousetrap is, is usually better, cheaper, faster. And it sounds like your the better, faster piece is, mm -hmm. is covered. Is it cheaper? Well, here's my question. The very simple thing of the logics. It's going to be cheaper to make something like that or the small tube that I have. So even when they come down in price from $20 to about $15, uh, I'm going to launch into about the $15, expecting them to come down to $12. Um, they can come down as much as they want. My cost of goods will be less than half of theirs. And that's part of your model is to constantly adjust to competition to always be under their Ready price for it. <laughs> yes, sir. What sort of consumer validation have you done to see whether people actually care about spitting in the thing? Because that, that's what I use for 23andMe, and so I thought it was actually kind of cool versus a urine test or blood test or a hair test. And then a clinical lab loving my stuff. I've gone to each one of my markets and, and, and asked that question. So we've done a fair amount of market research as well. Uh, this is a, a genetic company uh, saying that they uh, would like it. This is the uh, Louisiana State Police saying that they will love it. This is a uh, Kenyan who's one of the largest mass disaster companies. So I've got a lot of support. Uh, all of the markets I'm after are saying we can't wait. Well, I'm going to go to the Walgreens and I see the, the spit one and I see yours on the shelf. I can choose either one, and if I gotta scratch my cheek, or I gotta, you know, why would I choose yours over that one? Because I'm personally indifferent, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. So. I and this could be a lot of difference in features and benefits. Probably hard for me to say today exactly how we're going to differentiate. Um, don't always like to differentiate on price, obviously. But I'm thinking um, on the labs I'm working with right now, turnaround time is probably going to be the that, biggest that was, factor. Yeah, I think that was a good thing when you answered her question. If you can come, I was excited. You know, we mailed it in. We, we, it was a holiday. Six day. weeks. Yeah, I'm like, oh, and my wife's. I, I'm, I'm talking early. Ten days. Like, oh, you're a Neanderthal, and you know, you're 27. Yeah. <laughs> you're excited, <laughs> but you want to get it done. So, so, so the answer to your question, yeah. turnaround time will be the biggest. Factor. Yeah. Yeah. Do you control the 10 days, or is that part of 23? In the laboratories that I'm working with, the answer is yes. Okay, so but you have 23 to 23 and me now. Because even they labs. use third party, so they don't even control a lot of why it takes them six weeks. Right. Because so that's they what outsource. I was wondering if, if your product was going to affect that, or if it was really up to 23 and me or Ancestry or whatever, and whoever labs they choose, even though they're using your product, it still might not shorten the time. So right? the answer to your question is, if you take a look, and I ran a lab for 10 years, I, we did all the World Trade Center, bones from the World Trade Center, so I have a very good understanding of what it takes to turn around approximately do a thousand bones a week when I ran that laboratory from the World Trade Center. And the way we had to do was figure out the work process. And there's a lot of things from the point of accessioning that sample to getting it into your workflow, analyzing those results, doing your QC at the back end and getting it in. So as you look at that workflow, all we're focused on changing is the very first part. So you're absolutely correct. All I'm saying is that I'm setting things up in a way that it's a lot easier to work with something that's set up correctly from the get-go that will feed into a workflow and uh, allow the data. So for example, uh, to answer your question, actually where I put it, um, 
feel like a uh, person with a kitchen sink and wondering where to find it. Here it is. So this one um, has an RFID tag right in the bottom. So as I mentioned earlier, another aspect of healthy efficiency is making sure your data stays with the sample at all times. So the answer to your question is where you can take a horse to water, but you can't. You know, and that's what this will do. This is going to give the most efficient system should help them on their turnaround time. Right. Yes. I imagine uh, a key benefit to consumers is data safety or security. Um, I don't, you know, HIPAA laws apply to a lot of stuff, but I'm thinking from the mentality of a bunker dwelling paranoid. Um, if Ancestry has my DNA or maybe has access to it, it is now a saleable product for them. That's how they make most of their money. Is Gentry going to have a product advantage for me, the bunker dweller, saying that we don't keep your DNA, we deliver you the report? Yeah, that's further down the road than I have thought, to tell you the honest truth. So I'm still focusing in the product to market. But uh, given the fact that we've worked with sensitive data for 26 years at the uh, CODIS, that's the way we've been set up. Um, so the answer to your question is I'm focused on making money on the collection side on selling data on the back end. Well, that to me is a key marketing advantage to a certain type of buyer of which I subscribe to that second. Yes. So you have hand first. I was just curious to know more about the design process and how long did it take you to come up with the design? How many iterations? Um, where are you getting the product manufactured? Things like that. Okay. Um, design, um, I have designed uh, dozens of products over the years. So this is a combination of a lot of them. So. Um, you have to start off with the building blocks. How much desiccant do you need to uh, preserve so much um, material? So that's why we end up with this particular swab, knowing the capacity of if I take a lot of saliva, how much can I take on that, and making sure those ratios are all held true. Once you have those ratios held true, then we're looking at manipulation and ease of use as well as integration into the laboratory. So those were the building blocks around how we designed the product. There were a lot of options, but the size of it was based on this was the most popular size, the two mil Eppendorf tube. If you do any molecular application in the laboratory, it's basically what you're gonna do it in. Um, it, the, the front end, we made as versatile as problem as we possibly could, so you can take any kind of a swab and put it in there, so that way there was no uh, issue there. And once it was broken in, you pull a tab and close it, so manipulation was minimal. Those were the parameters. Yes. Um, so the Swap Saver is your primary product right now. Do you have other products you're hoping to patent? Or I have another uh, patent on its way and, and two more ideas uh, brewing. So this is a minimally a, in itself a product line. But as you saw, I have another uh, um, um, instrumentation company as I'm working with software companies. So customers are looking for finished goods in the package, ready to go, all done up in the boat. So the answer to your question that I want to put the software, I want instrumentation, <laughs> Here's the workflow solution, not here's a product. Yes, sir. Um, you may have answered this, but um, chain of custody is a big deal in the legal realm. Do you offer an advantage in that area in over traditional gathering techniques? Yeah, the, the chain of custody actually has a couple of elements to it that I think we do offer a number of advantages to. Number one, in just how you simplify the filling out of the information in the first place, what you're capturing and how you capture it is critical. So uh, if I can go to RFID and do what like a, a FedEx does or anyone that come up to your package and that data is right there, you minimize your mistakes right there, okay? Number two, you'll have an electronic chain of custody that this person was here at that particular time. It's not uh, time stamped and done. So the answer to your question is process as well as the information that flows through what has to be captured with it. Again, we've been doing uh, kits. Um, we've done evidence collection kits like this for the last 20 years. Uh, this is something sitting in the back of a cruiser, for God's sake. So when you take a look at it, open this up, we'll have the RFID tag in it. Oh, okay, so you, you supply an RFID, RFID it's tag. Right it's built right in. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Are you aware of any uh, federal or state legislative or regulatory pushes for, I guess, more stringent chain of custody <coughs> regulation, if so, is that a market opportunity? When I was in this committee, uh, that was a big consideration. As a matter of fact, we talked a lot about RFID, and as a matter of fact, they actually put out two booklets. One uh, we, I co-authored was the um, a handbook for biological evidence preservation, and the second was, was chain of custody using RFID. Uh, it used all techniques, so use barcodes, 2D barcodes, and, and handwriting, but it talked best practices of using each because they saw the issue. Yeah, true. 
You're counting that. Yes, is our, I don't know enough about <laughs> RFID. Is that uh, going to be the standard for what time frame in terms of? So if of you take a look at that, that uh, uh, device I showed you, that's currently used in every clothing you get out of Walmart at this moment. So the, the cost, it comes down. so if you're looking at the tipping point between barcode and 2D barcodes and RFID, uh, it depends on the volume, obviously plays a big role in that, but it's already tipped for things like clothing in Walmart. When it comes to smaller numbers, like here, we're only talking a, a million samples a year versus you know a few months, I see the tipping points a year or two away. Yes, sir. Randy, can you tell us about what, how's the fundraising going? Or how, I don't know when you started it. I'm still a one-man company. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Hmm. I, I've interested folks. Uh, I've presented to a number of groups multiple times. They've actually invited me back, so there's been high interest, but uh, I'm still a one-man company. Well, well, that's a good question, which is, is the company Swab Saver, or is the company Swab Saver plus, plus, plus? It's the plus, plus, plus. So right at the moment, the company is a resale company. So the contracts I've talked about with the sexual assault kit, that's me selling other companies' products too, though. So um, Fast Forward Forensics is a reseller. And that's how I'm able to do what I'm doing today. But in order to uh, do everything I'm looking to do here, I'm not making enough and doing this rest. You know, it's, I'm down to four hours of sleep as it is right now, so hard to do everything at the same time. Right, and that's my only critique of your presentation because I, I think there's a lot of good stuff in here. Mm -hmm. But you're you're selling me on the product, not necessarily the company. And by the way, I don't have any money, so don't look at me. <laughs> but, uh, but if I were, if I did have money, I'd be looking to buy a company, not just a product that could be supplanted by somebody else's better mousetrap. Mm -hmm. And. Um, you're right, I probably couldn't do more on the vision. Uh, with the short time frame that I had, I, I needed to emphasize why this company would do better than the next one. Uh, and the answer is mainly the product, the better most trap, why it'll do better. But yes, sir. Why are you uh, building your own production instead of just contracting? Um, the, a couple answers to that question, and finding good contractors in the area. So the answer is I'm open to that. I, and I looked to find others okay. that would do it. Um, couldn't find one. Really? But if you, could, if you know someone, I'm all ears. No, but it's a big plastic story. That's why I'm surprised you couldn't. Yeah, couldn't find uh, one who would do this. Because when you take a look at it, you're doing a fill into a plastic container. So when you take a look at that sandwich, I'm looking at a desk kit done by the tea bag that you normally get a desk in it has to be in there so you're not going to have any aerosol from that. Then that's plugged in in this, the uh, tin foil on top. I could not find one manufacturer who could do all that. Yes, sir. Hey, we have the tech council over there. Good to see you again. The, um, on the, just this may be simplistic, but the branding, you started out, you're changing your company name. You're just, are you are you entrenched in areas where they know you're, you know, a company and, and so you need to do some sort of... That's where price is not going away. So okay. if I ever get funding, the idea would be then I okay. presumably have to become a corporation on which fast forward prices would be division of. So I right. will not lose the equity, okay. but it wasn't a name I could go into new markets with yeah. it readily. Very good. Not a problem? No. Is that it? Well, we always like to end the presentation by asking what can we as the community do? We have a great group assembled of service providers, other entrepreneurs. You might have some, some insight if you have an ask or more. <laughs> yeah, I actually have uh, quite a few asks. So uh, as you saw where we are at this point, uh, Funding obviously is um, a critical thing at this point for us to uh, to move forward. So I am feel like I'm on Shark Tank every other week at this point. Uh, so anybody who you think might be interested in investing is obviously a, a big point to this. But as we gear up, um, you can see. Uh, Based the way the uh, business plan is working, um, I'll need about a dozen people uh, to uh, get the production going uh, over the next 12 months. So uh, we'll be looking to uh, hire, um, looking to get a, a clean room up uh, and running for, for doing this. And if you do have uh, someone who you think can actually do the manufacturing, factory, I'm all open I for doing it. Uh, now, yeah, yeah, but I'm all open to, to outsourcing it. So those are the areas I could use a, a lot of help in right now. Uh, I'm not uh, proud. I certainly wouldn't work with anybody to, to help get this. I'm really focused on thinking this is a much better solution that we uh, have available, and that's what I'm focused on getting done. Well, thank you so much, Randy, and thank you to our sponsors, School 59, Old National Bank, Crescendo, and the Library. And uh, thank you to all of you. Please keep coming back. See you next time.